Okay, then I suggest we start. Welcome back to the GINA online seminar after a long break. Uh, today's speaker is Chris Sullivan, and he did his bachelor at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, and since 2012, he's a PhD student at MSU. And he will tell us today about the sensitivity of Corcolab supernovae to nuclear electron capture. Okay, thank you very much, Ingo. And uh, as you said, I'm Chris Sullivan. And I will tell you a little bit about our recent work we've done to investigate the sensitivity of core collapse supernovae to uh, nuclear electron capture. So as a way of an outline, uh, what I'd like to tell you about uh, is the effort that our experimental group is uh, engaged in. Uh, so I'm a part of an experimental group at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab here at Michigan State. And our uh, main focus is on charge exchange reactions. Uh, and these measurements provide us uh, with a, essentially a unique ability to extract information about weak interaction physics. Uh, so I'll say a little bit about that and then also about a complementary effort that we've recently been engaged in to uh, uh, develop a weak interaction rate library that we can utilize in astrophysical simulations such as core collapse and how this is uh, ultimately uh, influencing uh, our experimental program and uh, hopefully uh, future theoretical studies as well. So as we know, uh, the weak interaction plays an important role in many astrophysical contexts, such as nucleosynthesis and stellar evolution, and thermonuclear supernovae, and neutron star crusts and neutron star mergers, and of course, in core collapse supernovae. Uh, and so for core collapse supernovae, the competitors of these uh, events are massive stars that have evolved in the order of 10 million years. Uh, there's some feedback, at least on our side. Please are not for this event. Okay. Anyway, I'll just go ahead and keep going. Uh, so the progenitors of these simulations of these uh, uh, massive uh, solar events are massive stars that have evolved from the order of 10 million years. Sorry about that delay there. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so uh, in, in, uh, in this environment, the core, because there's no uh, nuclear burning occurring, the core is pre uh, predominantly supported by electron pressure, which you can see in the left here in this pressure hierarchy I show you. Uh, and so in an environment like this, any process which is removing electrons from the system is obviously going to have a dramatic effect in that the star is supported primarily, or the core is supported primarily by the, this electron degeneracy. And so now I just want to show you a, another reaction which is completely separate, known as nuclear charge exchange. Nuclear charge exchange has the unique property that the reaction involved preserves the initial and final state in a, in a way uh, similar to electron capture. So you can see that there's a symmetry between the initial and final state in these two reactions. And it's this uh, fundamental symmetry that enables us as experimentalists to get at the information we need to understand astrophysical electron capture rates. And so, Looking in a little bit at the details for stellar electron capture, uh, they are uh, predominantly composed of gamma Teller's transitions, which are transitions mediated um, uh, uh, or that involve a spin and an isospin flip and that have no change in orbital angular momentum. And the electron capture rate really is just composed of two components. You can see here a phase space factor, which is just dependent on the thermodynamic quantities of the system and also the uh, uh, Q value of a particular reaction or a particular transition. So I'm showing you here a schematic level diagram where electron capture is occurring from a ground state nucleus into some several excited states as well as on the uh, excited state of the initial nucleus. And it also depends on the gamma of Teller strength, which is essentially the nuclear matrix element relevant uh, for the electron capture um, transition. So here I'm just showing you a typical a plot of a, a schematic gamma of Teller strength distribution where each of these uh, bars represents a strength to a transition in one of these levels here. And now the uh, Fermi energy in this phase space function or the electron energy in this phase space component comes in in the following way. If the electron has enough energy, it can capture into one of these states shown by this electron uh, distribution function. 
But as the density and temperature would increase in, say, a core collapse environment, you propagate your distribution outward and you're able to capture into more and more excited states, increasing your electron capture rate until all of these states are uh, open to electron capture. Now, as an experiment, from an experimentalist point of view, we're actually able to probe the, uh, directly the uh, matrix element necessary, that is the gamma of Teller strength, using charge exchange because uh, of a proportionality that exists between the differential cross-section for charge exchange and the matrix element, the B of GT, for each of these individual states. And so ultimately, the total electron capture rate that we have is just a sum over all of these transitions. But uh, obviously, uh, we can't measure everything. Uh, in fact, we can only measure a limited number of cases. Uh, but what experiment can do is provide a, a constraint or a benchmark on the theoretical um, rates. So in this region, I'm just showing you a, a a handful of nuclei which we performed measurements on, uh, shown in the red circles here, and we're able to use those uh, to infer electron capture rates from the derived strengths and compare those to electron capture rates calculated from theory, which is what I'm showing you on the right here. So this is the ratio of the theoretical and experimentally derived electron capture rates for a pre-supernova density and a uh, core collapse phase density and temperature. Each of the colors represents two separate microphysical models for uh, estimating the electron capture rates. The green and the red are uh, shell model, and the blue is uh, a quasi-random phase approximation. And you can see early on the pre-supernova stage, there's a variation that, uh, on the order of you know, four or five orders of magnitude. And in the core collapse regime, uh, it's probably maximally between 0.1 and 10, uh, or, or a, about two orders of magnitude here. But the shell model actually, if we zoom in, is doing remarkably well. Uh, for these stable nuclei. But this is the, I guess the takeaway from this is that uh, while the shell model does quite good, it's doing so in the region near stability in lower mass nuclei. And the shell model, because of the large model space that's involved, is not able to push to uh, large uh, or more neutron rich systems, uh, um, which may become important in core collapse, so I'll talk about in just a few moments. So since we have to rely mostly on theory, what we've done recently is to develop an open source weak interaction rate library that brings together all of the available weak interaction rate tabulations. So you can see there's uh, uh, more than five or about five uh, uh, tabulations that you can see here. And uh, they range from the Fuller, Fowler, and Newman set to the Langanka and martinez Pinedo shell model calculations. Um, but all of the nuclei which are shown, oops, sorry, shown in yellow here are nuclei for which we don't have a micro, uh, microphysical method for calculating electron capture rates. And so we have to apply on a uh, um, fairly basic approximation for the electron capture rate. Um, and it does fairly well at reproducing the overall trend of the electron capture rates for regions of nuclei near stability. But as you move away from stability, uh, it becomes a different story. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail as we go. So I just want to continue to let you know or, or move on a little bit and, and just say that this weak, li weak rate library is open source. It's available on GitHub, so you can, of course, fork it if you'd like to incorporate it into your code. Uh, it incorporates uh, uh, basically all the relevant weak interaction rates on heavy nuclei, uh, electron capture, beta plus, all the neutrino energy, energies, uh, losses, and then also the um, inverse direction for the beta minus uh, um, uh, weak interaction rates. And it's easily extended to incorporate new weak interaction rate tabulations. So if you have some laying around or you would like to incorporate your rate tabulation in the future, of course, just contact me as it's fairly easy to extend that. So as a first implementation, we've incorporated this weak interaction rate library into uh, GR1D, which is a core collapse code, um, in a spherically symmetric core collapse code employing uh, full general relativity and a uh, M1 neutrino transport scheme, which is uh, state-of-the-art um, uh, multi-dimensional neutrino transport. This is developed by Evan O'Connor. Uh, and in addition, it incorporates a, a wide variety of neutrino interactions in the uh, uh, neutrino interaction rate library new web. Uh, so again, this is a, this is a 1D code, um, and so you might wonder if the, the results are going to be actually indicative of what is happening in reality, because these events are obviously multidimensional. Uh, fortunately, the core collapse environment is, uh, or the core collapse phase is mostly spherical, because again, as I said from the beginning, 
the core is not uh, performing, there's no nuclear burning that's going on, and uh, uh, so there's no convection, and ultimately the collapse is pretty spherical. And so what is often done is, uh, because 1D can incorporate a number of different microphysics, we're able to take these 1D simulations after they get to core bounce and map them into 3D and actually then test the sensitivity of the explosion phase or actually then perform your, your, your multi-dimensional explosion phase simulation. So in addition to the weak interaction rate library, uh, for our study, what we've done is we've utilized three different equations of state. Uh, that, that is the SFHO, DD2, and TMA equation of state, which many of you are familiar with. Um, the SFHO equation of state, uh, uh, I'm showing here the neutron star mass radius relationship. And it's primarily tuned to reproduce neutron star constraints. So you can see it uh, perfectly, almost perfectly, uh, um, goes through the middle of this mass radius constraint by uh, Andrew Steiner and collaborators. It also gets the two solar mass constraint uh, or the maximum upper limit of the uh, two, two solar mass neutron star, at least that we've observed. The DD2 equation of state is a density dependent equation of state. Uh, and so it uses density dependent couplings, which could be important as we move to uh, several times nuclear saturation density. And the TMA equation of state is an equation of state that has been tuned, at, tuned actually to a large number of uh, um, binding energies and charge radii from the CI. So this is a pretty comprehensive set of equations of state. But one thing to uh, mention is that each of these equations of state uh, implement a different uh, a mass model that we use for both calculating the abundances and the electron capture Q values. Uh, and so you can see uh, just a, a schematic picture of the difference in the uh, predicted binding or, or masses for the FRDM mass model, which is associated with the SFHO and DD2 equations of state. And the, uh, uh, this, coming, uh, this uh, uh, relativistic mean field model that's from uh, Gang et al. And uh, it's uh, also um, uh, deviations in the, uh, with experimentally determined mass. And you can see actually FRDM does quite a bit better job in terms of the uncertainties. You can see that the, the masses only vary by about 2 MeV, whereas here we can get up to about 6, about negative 4. So uh, anyway, using these different mass models kind of will help us to understand the dependence on the masses overall in our simulation uh, of core collapse. So in addition to these equation of state, we utilize four progenitor models, three coming from the Woosley and Hager 2007 model set and one coming from the uh, uh, canonical Woosley and Weaver 95 model set. Uh, this is the, the 15 solar mass star that is well used in astrophysics. Um, and these roughly span the space of core compactness. So uh, together with our equation of states, we uh, are able to actually feel that we are, are getting a systematic understanding of the effect of electron capture based on a number of different astrophysical uh, inputs. All right, so diving into the details a little bit. What I'm showing you here is the electron fraction, the electron neutrino fraction, and the central density uh, during the collapse phase. And I'm also showing you the lepton fraction. And the lepton fraction is just the sum of these two quantities. Um, so early on, the material is just barely neutron rich. That is, the YE is around 0.42, where 0.5 would be roughly uh, equal numbers of neutrons and protons, because the electron fraction is just the charge to mass ratio. But quickly, the uh, uh, electron fraction and the lepton fraction also are decreasing. And the reason for this is that you are essentially replacing an electron in the environment with a neutrino. Um, and that neutrino is uncoupled from the matter almost immediately it leaves. And so this means that as long as the neutrinos are able to leave, the lepton fraction will be able to decrease and will be able to push towards more and more neutron-rich conditions. There is, however, a window of time in which electron capture can actually play a role, and that's set by the time in which it takes, uh, or the, the length of time it takes for neutrino trapping to occur, where the neutrinos are no longer actually able to leave. Um, and this occurs because of uh, coherent, electro, or coherent electron neutrino scattering on heavy nuclei, and it happens around densities of a few times 10 to the 12 grams per centimeter cube. So this essentially sets the window on which electron capture is actually able to play a role in the environment. And as an uh, uh, experimentalist, the question I obviously have is which nuclei are playing the most important role in the deleptimization phase of the core collapse? So which are actually removing the most electron pressure from the system and causing the collapse to accelerate? So to show you this, I should have a, a cartoon of the 500 most significant electron capturing nuclei um, given a, a certain time interval. So this is 
most important nuclei from zero to 10 percent, 20 percent, 30, all the way up to 80 percent. And you can see not a whole lot has changed. And I'm also showing you here the electron fraction is a function of central density. And here you can see that in that first 80 percent of time, two core bounds, not a lot, not a lot has happened with the electron capture rates because the rates for the most part are still pretty low. Um, but as we start to get to the region where the electron fraction is decreasing the most, you can see that uh, electron capture pushes the material to neutron rich conditions with much higher electron capture rates to the point in which neutrinos are trapped. And then we have the, uh, essentially a picture of the nuclei that are contributing the most during the core collapse phase uh, of a core collapse supernova. So zooming in on this a little bit. So this is our results for the 15 solar mass Woosling Weaver 95 progenitor in the SFHO equation of state. And you can see what I'm showing you here is essentially the color represents each individual nucleus's contribution to the reduction in the electron fraction uh, during collapse. So another way, if we were to sum the value of all of, the, all of these colors up, uh, the value that each of those nuclei or the sum that uh, each of those nuclei contribute to would essentially just be the difference in the electron fraction from P equals zero up to the neutrino trapping. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that of course this, uh, the abundances of the nuclei involved can play a role. And so all of the nuclei I'm showing you in the simulations above this line are uh, coming from, uh, or have masses which are experimentally determined. Uh, below this line are coming from the mass models which I uh, described just, or which I uh, motivated just a little while ago. And so that means all of these nuclei are without experimentally determined Q values and without uh, masses that go into our abundance calculation. So what is the effect if you use a different mass table? Well, this is an example of uh, the TMA equation of state with this relativistic mean field uh, mass model. And you can see between the two that there is actually a difference. However, I would say that the qualitative uh, description is still roughly the same, that the primary electron capture uh, channel of nuclei runs from the PF shell up to the N equals 50 shell gap, where there is a large amount of electron capture occurring up into the N equals 82 uh, shell closure as well. So from a rate perspective, we want to ask which nuclei are actually uh, in, uh, have uh, sophisticated rates in this region. And the answer is not many. Uh, most of the nuclei in the important regions you can see, such as the N equals 50 and 82 shell closures, are coming from this analytic approximation, which I mentioned early on. And this approximation, while it does a good job at reproducing the rates of the uh, different shell model tabulations near stability, as you move to neutron-rich systems, likely this approximation is overestimating the rate. And the reason for this is that from a microphysical or from a shell model perspective, we can look at a uh, you know, some characteristic nucleus such as nickel 60, which sits about here. And electron uh, capture can happen if a proton in the uh, nucleus is converted into a neutron in the following way, or by moving from an excited state in the P3 half to the P1 half neutron uh, valence shell. But the story is quite a bit different if we go to, say, nickel 78, which is much more neutron rich. In this case, we have a completely full neutron rich uh, neutron um, shell all the way through a full G9 half shell. And in this case, you want to electron capture in the following way. But of course, that can't happen because of the Pauli exclusion principle, which is preventing an electron uh, proton, another neutron being added to the system. And so what this means is that if we want to unblock here, we actually have to have uh, several order, uh, orders of, uh, of, of steps. We need to be able to excite something out of the G9 halves. We have to need to excite something from the F5 halves or the P3 halves or any of these levels of these higher lying excited states in order to make a hole for this proton. Regardless, the like, regardless of configuration and, and considerations of the model space, likely the electron capture rate, which is uh, coming from this approximation out here in the neutron rich conditions, is going to be overestimated since these are this approximation is being fit to nuclei uh, in the near stability where you have much less poly blocking occurring. So this gives us a sort of a uh, idea of what our uncertainty in these rates are. So what we've done is performed a sensitivity study in which we systematically varied the electron capture rates by factors uh, shown here, where the uh, increased maximally by a factor of 10 and decreased maximally by a factor of 0.1 where warmer colors are a more enhanced rate and cooler colors are a more decreased rate. And we've done this for this set of six uh, progenitor and equation of state combinations. 
Uh, in addition, we would like to understand how sensitive the simulations are to, this, uh, to, these, to these rates, in particular to the nuclear physics inputs. Uh, and so the way we can understand, or at least compare the sensitivity, is by looking at a, a different sensitivity study we perform, where we instead fix the electron capture rates and vary the progenitor model that we use. And to do that, we grab 32 different uh, initial stellar, mo uh, stellar models with zero range main sequence mass from about 12 to 120. So I'm showing you here their core compactness as a function of their mass. These are coming from the Woosley and Hager 2007 models. There. All right, so jumping into the results a little bit, I'm showing you here again the lepton fraction as a function of central density. And you can see right away the uh, simulations with an enhanced rate are uh, collapsing much quicker. Uh, so you, you, you essentially you deleptonize very quickly early on, but uh, uh, eventually things begin to level out. And something interesting to point out is if I was to take the trapped lepton fraction at the following central density and look at that trapped lepton fraction value, this is after neutrino trapping, as a function of our systematic scaling factor, we see an interesting result. So I'm showing here in this red diamond, this is the uh, systematics, uh, this is the reference calculation. And what we find is that even though we increase the electron capture rate to 2, 4, and 10, instead of seeing further deleptonization occur, we actually see at some point an increase in the number, uh, in the increase in the lepton fraction. So this is a, uh, uh, might be puzzling uh, at first, but the, it, it's actually quite simple. I mentioned this to you before that we have this window in which electron capture can efficiently operate. Well, what happens when we increase the opacities and increase the, uh, the neutrinos in the system by increasing the electron capture rate overall, we actually uh, basically fill out the neutrino phase space and we cause uh, coherent neutrino scattering on heavy nuclei to start earlier. So this window is, uh, is roughly reduced and you get less electron capture occurring overall. So you get then this uptick in the lepton fraction. But I think uh, and so I'm just showing this to you here for the, the SFHO and the Woosley Weaver 95. But we see this trend for all of our simulations, where the uh, increase in the electron capture rate doesn't have nearly as an effect as the de decrease in the rate does. Now this is, I think, has an important implication, but I'll uh, uh, come back to that in just a few slides. Okay, so I've shown you a lot about the lepton fraction. Uh, but why does the lepton fraction matter? Who cares? Uh, of course, does it affect anything in the core collapse? Uh, so I want to show you that it in fact does make a big difference. So what I'm showing you is a picture of shock formation. I'm showing you three plots. The entropy, the density, and the velocity is a function of enclosed mass. And to start at the top, an entropy of about 1.0 uh, means that your matter is roughly nuclei. You have uh, mostly iron peak nuclei. Uh, and the density that we're starting at is about densities of uh, 10 to the, uh, about around neutrino trapping. So as we move, or as we uh, increase our density towards nuclear saturation density, you see a shock form. It dissociates nuclei, causing the entropy to increase. And then the shock propagates throughout the star and hopefully explodes the star, of course not in 1D. Um, so let's go back and look at this one more time because there's a lot of uh, interesting physics here. So before I mentioned to you that the times 10 case, where we increase the electron capture rates by a factor of 10, that actually caused an increase in the lepton fraction as compared to times four. Well, the simulation we see that has a core bounce occur first is the times four simulation. So this is the one with the lowest lepton fraction, fraction that I showed you in the prior slide. But something even more interesting happens. So, so essentially what this is saying is increasing the electron capture rates up to a factor of four is in, or causing the collapse time to happen quicker more quickly, but something interesting happens. In just a few milliseconds, the simulations with a decreased set of electron capture rates overtake the simulation with the uh, enhanced electron capture rate. So this might be mysterious, um, but actually it's quite simple. But as you can see, then as the shock propagates outward, actually the, the, the decreased rates uh, um, have more kinetic energy, and you see this broadening of the different shock profiles. So what's going on? So I'm just showing you here a, uh, a snapshot of the four different uh, characteristic time profiles from the, the prior video. What we see immediately is that at core bounce, the mass behind the shock, otherwise known as the, uh, the proto-neutron star inner core mass, varies on the 20% level. 
Um, and this mass is essentially communicated directly into the amount of uh, um, gravitational binding energy that you give to your shock as kinetic energy. And so the simulations with a larger uh, inner core mass have more kinetic energy or are able to propagate outward and explode the star more easily. Um, so this again is just the one simulation, but if we look at all of our six equation of state and progenitor sensitivities, we see a uh, comparable trend. And we also see that the, the asymmetry from the uh, lepton fraction is also appearing here. So this range is corresponding to this range exactly for this for simulation. Now, if we are trying to understand how this compares to varying the astrophysical input, that is, if we perform our sensitivity study where we fix the rates and vary the progenitor model, we actually see a modest uh, change in the inner core mass on the order of only a few percent, maybe four or five percent. And so we see that in this case, the electron capture rates are play, uh, playing a primary role in determining the, uh, the overall sensitivity to the proto-neutron star inner core. Another thing that is uh, very dependent on the electron capture rates is the neutrino emission. So I'm showing you here just a cartoon of a star as it's collapsing and forming a shock. The shock forms, which is this line that you can see here, and propagates outward, dissociating electron, uh, dissociating uh, iron group nuclei. And when it does this, it con uh, converts these nuclei into free nucleons, such as protons. And those protons quickly electron capture and have a large neutrino emission. But this neutrino emission only occurs when the neutrino sphere, which is this dashed line, propagates inward enough to touch the shock, the shock prompt. Essentially, when the neutrino sphere and the shock uh, meet, and for uh, um, you know, for the non-expert in the field, the neutrino sphere is essentially just the point at last interaction when uh, before early on the inside of the neutrino sphere, you have the neutrinos uh, scattering and uh, bouncing around, and outside the neutrino sphere, they're mostly able to freely stream out of the core and the rest of the star. So, in our simulation, I showed just uh, some schematic plots of the of the neutrino sphere where the blue is for the decreased rate, or yeah, decreased rates, and the orange is for the enhanced rates. And you can see that the first uh, uh, neutrino, or the neutri uh, for the decreased rates, the neutrino sphere reaches the shock uh, first, and only maybe one millisecond after bounce. So in this case, we have a prompt emission of neutrinos. You basically, uh, when the neutrino sphere hits the shock, you're turning on your neutrino light bulb, and you have this prompt emission, but it takes on the order of four or five more milliseconds for the uh, uh, increased or enhanced rate simulations to actually have their neutrinos propagate in, out, of the, uh, out of the neutrinos. And so this translates directly into the uh, luminosity of the uh, neutrinos. So I'm showing you the electron um, the peak neutrino luminosity in this big plot here, and also the heavy electron neutrino luminosities and the uh, anti-electron neutrinos. And you can see that there's a variation in the peak luminosity on the order of plus minus 20%. And you can see again that the peak, uh, uh, the, the largest neutrino luminosity is emitted promptly, whereas you have a delayed emission of the electron uh, neutrinos from the enhanced simulation. So this is again just showing you that this result is uh, corroborated by most uh, all of our equation of state and progenitor simulations. And uh, if we compare again with the sensitivity study in which we fix the electron capture rates, we see again a modest variation in the peak electron neutrino. And just so that you don't feel like I'm pulling the wool over your eyes, uh, of course the variations are not so large in every uh, quantity that we look at. Um, here I'm showing you the central entropy and the central temperature as a function, uh, or at bounce. Um, and you can see that in uh, uh, these cases, the variation due to electron capture rates is comparable to those uh, from the progenitor. So I think that the implication of this work uh, um, are, are somewhat staggering. So if we consider at what I told you in the, uh, very early on, that the simulations are more sensitive to a overall decrease in the electron capture rate. That fact coupled with uh, the, the fact that the uh, uh, nuclei which are contributing the most to the delepinization are those which don't have a sophisticated microphysical um, rate uh, done for their calculation and likely are overestimated because of poly exclusion. We are likely to, uh, or to be in a scenario where the electron capture rates, at least during the core collapse phase, are the leading order uncertainty into setting some of these important core collapse quantities. 
And so the question is obviously, does the explosion phase have a memory of what happens in core collapse? Because if it does, this, is, this uncertainty will propagate into the later stages of collapse and play a primary role there also. So to summarize, uh, charge exchange experiments provide the needed information to estimate uh, um, stellar electron capture rates, but we can't measure everything. We have to know which nuclei we should perform our experiments on, and we can do this by performing sensitivity studies. And to do this, we, we've actually implemented a new weak interaction rate library into a core collapse simulation. And ultimately, this work is informing us of which nuclei are most important and uh, uh, um, feeding back in on our experimental program. Uh, so for example, we are recently proposed an experiment to perform on Krypton-86, which is the uh, most proton deficient N equals 50 nucleus, nucleus in this region of uh, significance that I um, described in this talk. But because this is a, a GINA MA2 seminar, and uh, uh, I might make a few requests from the GINA community. I think experiment is, uh, from experiment, I think it's obvious we need more charge exchange measurements and more mass measurements in the region above A equals 65 and for neutron rich nuclei. From the theory side of things, it's critical that we have a new microphysical model that's able to predict gamma off teller strengths for ground state and excited state uh, transitions on nuclei in the same regions with near the N equals 50 and N equals 82 shell correlations. And from the astrophysics, we need multi dimensional simulations that investigate how the microphysical electron capture rates uh, in 1D, how this carries over into the multi-D simulation and specifically into the explosion phase. Because in the end, if the explosion phase just forgets about what happens in the core collapse phase, then it doesn't matter. So this is obviously something that's very important. Uh, maybe just say anecdotally uh, from the astrophysics community, if you have a uh, simulation which depends, uh, depends on the weak interaction rates with heavy nuclei, uh, you might consider also running a similar sensitivity study due to the uncertainty in these rates. And if you're interested, you can of course contact me uh, and we can uh, incorporate your, our, our weak interaction rate library into your code. Um, and so uh, I, I just want to make acknowledgement of my collaborators shown in this bottom list here. And with this, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very nice talk. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know in the chat, and I would start, uh, suggest that we start with MSU. So, yeah, please ask questions. Yes. This is not quite fair, but do we have any information on how, when you go to Model D, how sensitive? Um, has anyone tried to do a, any kind of study with what's going to happen in Model D, how it propagates? Whether the sensitivity remains the same, whether it makes it a little more robust against changes. Yeah, I mean, so uh, the uh, the question is in multi D, does the electron or does do we know if roughly the neutrino sensitivity or the neutrino opacity are playing an important role? I guess because it's they've never done that compared to one D. So I'm just wondering if there's any hints as to which way will be more sensitive, less sensitive. Uh, yeah, so a, a bit outside my wheelhouse, but. The, uh, uh, I would say that uh, what we know from 3D is that it's neutrino heating, for instance, is more efficient. It's something that Sean Couch has uh, um, on, or said quite a bit about. And, uh, and so I think that if there uh, is a large variation in the neutrino uh, luminosities coming post-bounce, then yes. I think the electron capture rates, uh, uh, the variations, they don't actually have a large variation in the neutrino luminosity much later on. Um, so that maybe is not the case, but actually I would say what you will or where the sensitivity will come from is the initial conditions on which you're starting your three-dimensional simulation. Does the proton-neutron star mass actually matter for the eventual explosion of the star? I don't know, maybe Sean can say more. I mean, we're, we're playing around with this. And varying the electron capture rates so far has resulted in, think your answer, the, it seems like it's, it's Looking like it's sort of forgetting the initial conditions when it explodes. There, there are not monotonic trends like what we see during the, the early post bounce phase with things like the core mass and the peak luminosity. But I would, I guess, I would say that that's a bit tentative because it's only 2D. Only 2D, of course, you are 
uh, in a situation in which there's large stochastic, stochasticity, we vary the density just a little bit, and we see exactly the same same result. So uh, maybe we need maybe we need three. What about the last part of the presupposition? It'll certainly affect the collapse, but that's the part that's electron capturing is still roughly spherically symmetric. Question. Okay. So at the n equals 50 and n equals 82 shell closures, there have been shell model calculations of the half-lives for the R process. So this is kind of a common. I think you only at the shell closure. Right. But would that, have you looked at that? Does that already help? Uh, so it's for beta decay? Yeah, it was for beta decay. Yeah, right. but can you. Uh, I think that. Uh, I mean, for beta decay, you only have the one transition or a few transitions from excited states. So yeah. uh, uh, in, with the electron energies that we're dealing with, we're talking about the primary contribution from the uh, electron capture rate is coming from strength that's up to high excitation energy. So you would, you, would get, you would get a small component of the electron capture rate that occurs. But of course, you're not going to have uh, the large fraction of the strength that's available at you're saying their model spaces are only adequate for the next Yeah, because you're only capturing, if you were to use the beta decay strength in the opposite direction. No, no, but use the same calculation. Oh, use them all, that, yeah. I, that I can't comment on. Maybe yeah. you can do that. Yeah, no, it's, it's very difficult because if you go in the beta minus direction, there are basically P and minus P. So there are some small variations, even a large, relatively large uncertainty in the calculations which you have with those shell model calculations. It's still somewhat of a minor perturbation. Um, but the strength going in the beta plus direction, which is what you use for electron capture, so that's minor modification in the beta minus direction is a huge modification. Some, the sum will must be big. And so, you know, a few percent error in the beta minus direction is a huge error in the beta plus. I don't think the error in the beta minus direction is just so. So I think basically um, we have to be we're trying it a little bit. Um, doesn't look very good, uh, but it's not surprising. To me. So it's much more sensitive than the beta minus. Ingo, are there any questions? No, I don't okay. so, No, we don't have any questions. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, I guess not. And yeah, thank you very much. And see you.